Well, aside from rapid tests, how else will the federal government uh, help uh, provinces weather the Omicron storm? Dominic LeBlanc is the Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs, and he's in Moncton. Minister, thanks for joining us today. Good evening, Paul. Happy New Year. Thanks. Same to you. Um, so 140 million rapid tests are to be delivered to provinces and territories, enough for each person in the country to take one rapid test a week for one month. But why not just follow what the UK has done uh, and directly mail a, you know, one free test kit to each household across the country? So I, I think, Paul, it's understandable that Canadians and provinces are certainly anxious to receive uh, an adequate supply of these rapid tests. It's a key part of public health measures in every part of our country. Um, we have, from the beginning of the pandemic, uh, been a valuable partner in helping provinces, if it was with vaccines or now with rapid tests, with some support in terms of healthcare personnel where we can. Our job as a national government is to get as many of those tests into the hands of provincial authorities as possible. Some people have used, for example, uh, UK and the Royal Mail. One of the challenges, we have a different climate uh, than the United Kingdom, and it's not clear that Canada Post leaving in people's mailboxes at minus 30 on the prairies, rapid test. It, it's not as simple as some have pretended. Uh, we think the most effective way and the most secure way to ensure Canadians have access to those tests is to do what we've done since the beginning of the pandemic, is get them in the hands of provincial authorities who are competent in terms of administering or distributing them to the populations in their jurisdiction. That, in our view, is the most effective way we can, we can collaborate with provinces. Meanwhile, today we heard uh, Dr. Tam talking about the challenges around uh, the results from these rapid tests. I mean, how useful is it to have all these tests when medical professionals are saying results from a test is good for maybe eight to 12 hours and then, you know, they appear to be not as sensitive, at least when it comes to Omicron? That, that certainly we've heard those conversations from healthcare experts. I've heard Dr. Tam brief ministers, uh, Paul, on exactly that issue. Um, that's why those rapid tests constitute at a point in time uh, a reliable a COVID test. It may also be a different test if somebody would be fully vaccinated. Those are the conversations that experts are having. Um, it, it's not It's not a magic bullet. It's not a perfect answer. Uh, but access to rapid tests is very much part of having safe workplaces, of allowing certain professionals in, uh, in essential service jobs to safely go to work. Um, so uh, we're going to continue to do what we have to as a national government, 140 million rapid tests in January and this month alone in the hands of provincial and territorial authorities. Uh, we're going to continue to do that. And provinces uh, also, in our view, are entirely well placed to decide medically, to your point, what is the proper use of those tests. There are, of course, the PCR tests, the lab based tests that are used in the diagnostic context. Again, provinces, because of the sheer volume of cases, are making decisions around how to properly use the other layer of testing, the, the PCR test. So all of these decisions are, are properly in the hands of provincial authorities. And frankly, we're very confident and everything we're hearing uh, gives us every reason to be confident that provincial and territorial authorities are making the right decisions uh, as, as the situation evolves. Uh, evolves in different jurisdictions because no jurisdiction in Canada might be in an identical position to another jurisdiction. That's why, in our view, the best thing we can do is support them uh, in any way possible, and then they can make the decisions that they're properly able to make in terms of how to use these resources. I think you're right to say there's no silver bullet uh, on this, one of the lessons we've learned uh, throughout the pandemic. But there are increasingly new tools, and and one of them uh, as we've seen in the U.S., uh, which seems to be, you know, looking more toward oral treatments, the new Pfizer antiviral pill uh, that's rolling out down there. There, there. You know, provinces here are saying, you know, maybe the federal government can expedite approval uh, of that in this country. Jason Kenney was making that point, I think, yesterday uh, uh, from Edmonton. What's the timeline on that? When will this pill be approved in Canada and then rolled out to the provinces? So, again, an, another very important, as you said, weapon in the fight against COVID, a very important instrument. Um, 
Health Canada is currently going through the independent scientific approval process. It's not uh, politicians that approve medications as being safe and effective for Canadians. It's experts working with Health Canada. The good news is that work is proceeding expeditiously. We're hoping uh, in the next couple of weeks, in the next few weeks, we may have a decision from the regulator at Health Canada. The good news is the government has already taken steps to procure very significant quantities of these uh, antiviral medications, of these therapeutics, uh, which would, as soon as it's approved, uh, be in the hands of, of provincial health authorities and, and doctors and hospitals to use. So we're doing uh, the work as expeditiously as we can. But as you know, it, it, these are independent regulators that have the responsibility of making those decisions. Uh, we're confident that they are working expeditiously. Everybody understands the urgency of it. But what we've done as a government is ensure that we have the procurement steps in place. So once the regulatory approval is given, we hope soon, uh, we'll be in a position to have very considerable quantities of these medications available for doctors across the country. How would you define soon? Uh, again, I, 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 the Health Canada uh, scientists, regulators, Paul, are working through the data with Pfizer uh, and other pharmaceutical companies. We're hoping in the next few weeks. But as I say, this, uh, this isn't a place where people cut corners or politicians uh, are in a position to pressure regulatory authorities. They're doing their work, but they certainly understand, I think as all Canadians do, uh, the importance of this work being done expeditiously uh, so that Canadians might be able to benefit in the case of an approval of these medications, like, as you said, is, is, is the case uh, in some other jurisdictions already. Health Minister Duclos said January 2022 is not March of 2020, but we're seeing schools and businesses being locked down again uh, in various parts of the country. Uh, you know, used to be the threshold to get back to normal life we all thought was going to be vaccination numbers. Well, that's changed. So in your view, what's the end game? Like, when do we get out of this pandemic? Um, so, uh, Paul, everybody is understandably asking those questions uh, on an ongoing basis. We certainly understand that Canadians are anxious uh, to find a sort of normal routine uh, that, uh, that would be safe and appropriate. Um, vaccination still remains by far the most effective way uh, to help us collectively emerge from COVID. It's the single best thing that one can do to ensure that uh, if you're unlucky enough to, to get COVID, uh, the course of the, of the illness will be much different if you're vaccinated than if you're not vaccinated. That speaks to putting pressure on healthcare resources that provinces have. Um, so we think Omicron has, and Dr. Tam and others have said so publicly, in terms of its transmissibility, the fact that it's so contagious, uh, has presented another challenge uh, for provincial public health authorities as they make, as you said, those tough decisions around opening schools, keeping learning virtual in schools, different restrictions on businesses. Um, those are decisions that governments, provincial governments, in many cases make. Uh, to protect their citizens in the interest of preserving their healthcare capacity and protecting their citizens. So we're going to continue to do uh, what it takes for as long as it takes uh, to support Canadians through COVID and to be there to support provinces and territories who have the responsibility of making those difficult decisions. But they know, and the Prime Minister has said it repeatedly in dozens of conversations with premiers across the country that I've had a chance to participate uh, in, uh, we will be there for as long as it takes to do whatever it takes to support those provinces uh, so they can make those difficult decisions, knowing that the government of Canada will be there to support them and the citizens uh, in their jurisdictions as well. I, I respect that the continued message to get vaccinated and to get that booster. We saw the prime minister getting his booster yesterday. But if you look at the graph of, of the, uh, the Canadians who had their shots, it goes up, but then it flattens and it has it been flat-ish for a while. Do you, does the federal, does the government accept that there will always be a percentage of Canadians that will not get vaccinated? And what are the implications of that for this country? Because it has been effectively flat for a while. It, it has been. Uh, it, it still ticks upwards. I look at those graphs too and look at those 
uh, numbers. We get daily reports of, of those numbers. And I talked to the Premier of Newfoundland and Labrador uh, this week again, very happy in his jurisdiction at the very high numbers of people that have been boosted and have been vaccinated. Um, at the end of the day, some people may uh, decide that they're not going to get vaccinated. Um, it's going to be increasingly difficult for those people in some workplaces, as we know, uh, their ability to travel, their ability to, if I want to go out for dinner in Moncton tonight uh, in a restaurant that has a reduced capacity, uh, they're going to check my vaccination status when I get to the door of the restaurant. So uh, those are the measures that, in many cases, provincial authorities and the government of Canada within our jurisdiction have taken to try and push that number as high as we can get it. Uh, but at the end of the day, people have, in our view, Paul, a collective responsibility to think of those persons that perhaps have compromised immune systems, those elderly people that may be less able uh, to resist a particular virus. Uh, those are the people that are at risk often. And the people who decide not to get vaccinated are putting, in many cases, their co-workers or members of their family at an increased risk. And we think the huge majority of Canadians will do the right thing. And the good news is, if you look at other jurisdictions around the world, Canadians have massively stepped up uh, to get vaccinated, to now get the boosters. Uh, so we're very enthusiastic by how Canadians have responded to the scientific and medical evidence that says this is the best single thing you can do to protect yourself and people you care about and your community. So we're not pessimistic. And we think Canada, frankly, Paul, should be very proud as a country uh, of how Canadians have stepped up. It, 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 it's an envy of many jurisdictions, but we can continue to encourage people that remaining percentage, they can still make that difference by booking an appointment at a, at a pharmacy or a vaccination clinic tomorrow. So it's not never too late to get your first shot. And it certainly is the time to get your booster. All right. We'll leave it at that for now. Um, thank you, Minister. Appreciate your time. Well, thanks for having me on the program. For more on this, Dr. Allison McGeer is an infectious disease physician and a senior clinician scientist at Sinai Health System. She's in Toronto. Dr. McGeer, thanks for joining us today. Nice to talk to you, Paul. Um, so the federal government sending uh, 140 million rapid tests to the provinces and territories this month. What are your thoughts on that? Good move? Yes, I think so. You know, we, we, we do need to be careful, I think, not to become too dependent on rapid tests, but layered on top of all the other things we're doing, I, I, they have the potential to help. Are, are they reliable with Omicron? Um, Dr. Tam was noting today that essentially uh, the data is still coming in, but, you know, some rapid tests can pick it up. But that said, she noted the pace of ineffectivity um, is faster, i.e. you could test negative in the morning, but that doesn't mean you'll be negative later on. So how does, I mean, I'm confused. Does this complicate things? Well, yeah, you know, it's not simple and, and you're right. It takes some time, you know, with a new variant, it, it, it takes some time for people to put the data together to understand what shedding of Omicron looks like over time and uh, how that's related to transmission in households. I think it's it's not unreasonable for the moment um, to make the assumption that there's not going to be a dramatic change um, in the 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 value of rapid tests for Omicron as compared to previous variants but is something that we need to be keeping our eyes on for sure um, for the next period of time. Uh, but, you know, rapid tests are, by their nature, complex. There's different types of rapid tests. Um, they have somewhat different performance characteristics. Some of them are more prone to problems with user error from people who are not used to using them than others. Um, so they are, their results are not the same uh, as the results of a PCR test or, or some of the some of the rapid tests that are used in laboratories as opposed to just being used by absolutely everybody. Nonetheless, I, I think we're seeing the demonstration that in many settings, a positive rapid test tells you 
at the moment with the situation with Omicron tells you with pretty high reliability that you do have COVID. And to the extent that people getting positive rapid tests may be more likely to self-isolate and to stay away from other people, that's probably going to help us with reducing transmission of Omicron. Negative tests, you know, cut both ways. They, they increase the probability that you're not shedding virus at the moment, but of course there can be false negative tests, right? You can't have a negative test and say, oh, I know I'm not infected at the moment. Um, and as you pointed out, they also, you know, it, it's a test in the moment. So they don't tell you what your shedding is going to be like two hours from now or six hours from now or eight hours from now. Um, so as long as we're using negative tests and understanding, you know, what they're helping us with and not using them as a, as a passport to, you know, do what we might like, um, then, then they are of value. So a positive is a positive. A negative is perhaps negative, but you don't know for sure. Yep. So am I right in thinking, in a sense, what, what the value of the rapid tests are, besides, obviously, there's value w when you can say that you're positive because you can take action. But the, the, the rest of the value is it kind of mitigates, in a sense, the, the, the danger you might uh, present because you might have it. Is, is that right? Like, you, you, can act, you, you can't act with certainty, but I don't know. That, that's where it gets complicated. You know? I think that's, that's the problem for a lot of people when they're confronted with rapid tests now because we're hearing about it all the time. That what does it mean when you get a negative? Well, you know, what it means is that there is a reasonable probability, not absolute, but reasonable probability that you're not shedding virus at this point in time. So that the places that people are talking about using them are things like, um, you know, we know that um, there's a very high risk of transmission of COVID in long-term care homes. So we want to be as sure as we can that we're reducing the risk of transmission and that means better ventilation it means people wearing masks it means people wearing respirators it means good hand hygiene it means maintaining social distancing um but i think in general we have agreed that there are circumstances where it, it also helps to have people coming in test negative for covid when they come in okay not Again, not as a be all and end all, but it's just one more step in the, the probability, um, one more way of slightly reducing the exposure of long term care homes to um, to this virus. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's what I meant by mitigating. That's a good way to put it, yeah. actually. It's like physical distancing doesn't mean you won't get it, but it helps. Masks don't mean you won't get it, but they help. Um, yeah. Right? Me, so, we, so the federal government is giving enough tests for one test per person per week for the month of January. It, it, is that number enough? Is that adequate? I, you know, I, I, I honestly don't know. You know, we haven't been through, um, you know, exactly what we should be using them for and, and how we're using them. And I think there's, there's not a lot of data about their relative benefits. Um, you know, it depends on which test you're using it and how you're using it. So we're really counting at the moment on expert opinion about where they're most likely to be useful. Um, and I think that expert opinion is, is quite varied in different parts of the country. Um, what they're supplying is probably more than enough for what uh, the, the guidance in some places in Canada and, and maybe not enough for the guidance in other places in Canada. And none of us know with certainty what's right. Does that mean they should be distributed, I don't know if unevenly is the right word, in, within provinces? Uh, like, uh, how, how should the rollout go in provinces in your view? Because I don't think we know details on that yet. Well, I, th I, I, you know, I think it's up to the provinces to, to think about how they're being used within their province and to request them. And at the moment, public health guidance on using these tests is significantly different in different provinces. And, you know, this is life in Canada, right? We are, we are not the same coast to coast to coast. Um, and so, yes, I would think it would be logical for the government to be talking to the provinces about how they're planning to use the tests and, and what they think their needs are. Life in Canada and, and life during COVID, <laughs> an ever-evolving uh, challenge. 
Um, yep. Thank you for your time, Dr. McGear. Thank you. Pleasure. Take care. Bye-bye. Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.